to God. This is Minister Pia with Reaching Out, Pulling In Ministries, and I'm back again to share the gospel. I'll say that again. Worship is as misunderstood a doctrine as any other within the church. And why I say that is because in the church, in the body of Jesus Christ, people have a tendency to think The message but ask them what the name of it is ask them what did it do to affect them you'll find out that they're not really listening to the Word of God but that's not it that's not what I'm trying to get to because that's another series what I'm trying to
one that created you, the one that gave you life. And I state it again, and life more abundantly. It's an act of reverencing and submitting yourself and saying, Lord, I thank you for allowing me to see another day. God, I thank you for creating me. I thank you for the breath that I breathe. I thank you for the air that I feel that moves, yet I cannot see it. I thank you for my family. I thank you for my home. I thank you for the things that I have. And after you thanking him, but you just really, just really thinking, thanking him for who he is. That he is the one that created you. So as I said, worship is definitely not just going in the church when you hear a song and then it's over with. Worship is also not limited to only bowing in reverence before God. That is another act when you're worshiping him and you're truly in his, your, your body. For me, my body is going to go down and I'm going to, to respect him. And by me doing that, by me bowing down him, I'm letting him know, God, I realize that I am nothing without you and I reverence you. So I don't mind getting on the ground for the one that made me. To begin with worship is only determined by God himself. And not everything we do is accepted to God as worship just because we are sincere or it makes us feel good. Let me say that again. To begin with, with it, worship is only determined by God himself. And not everything we do is accepted, accepted to God. As worship just because we are sincere or it makes God feel it makes us feel good Hebrews 12 um, 28 tells us that we must serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear that's a new King James Version the Greek word translates serve here is a form of the word worship and is used 21 times in the New Testament in the context of service and worship do I need to repeat that again? The Greek word translated serve here is a form of the word worship and is used 21 times in the New Testament in the contents of service and worship. Another form of the word worship is in the Greek word therapelio, which from which we get the, the uh, English word therapy. And this is most often seen translated heal in reference to the healing of others. In the New Testament, this word is seen in every case of Jesus' healing. So as we worship him, it's a sense of therapy. That's where they get that word from. In the English, they, from which we get the English word therapy. And if you think about therapy, it's a healing. As, the, as you go to a therapist, that person, um, you have an accident, like I had it ankle injury and I had to go to a therapist to, to get me back to where I was. And so she would massage my ankle and make me move my ankle in certain ways and I would do a lot of different things to help my ankle get stronger. So that was a therapeutic uh, impl implication. She implied, She applied therapy to help me get to where I needed to be. So you think about God, hallelujah, it's a form of therapy. It gets us to where we need to be because we are all messed up without him. So you think about that, and this is the most often seen in translated healing in reference to the healing of others. And in the New Testament, this word is seen in every case, as I stated, of healing. Other uh, Greek words translated worship are proskuneo, meaning paying homage. In 1 Corinthians 14.25, uh, it goes into to that. It's telling us about what God has done. It tells us about the act of worshiping God. Um, God, is, uh, a, God is to be reverenced. God is to be honored. God is to be looked at and respected because he's God. 
because he's uh, your creator. And you think about that. You think about your mother and your father that you feel is the one that brought you that 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 of course yes he used the, your mother and father to bring you to this earth but he is the he is your creator he is the one that did it all and you your mother and your father in most cases you respect them you honor them you love them because of who they are and what they've done for you you know all that good stuff but you know it you when you look at what God has done when you look at how great he he was to even make you wow you know it's just it's just an awesome thing so I want to go into first Corinthians 14 and uh, I'll go to verse 25 and 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 and, and if you look at the the caption over that chapter, it's, it's in the a New International Version. It talks about worship. Now I'm going to go start from the beginning. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, but no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in tongues edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets it, so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge of prophecy or word of instructions, even in the, the case of lifeless things that made make sounds, such as the pipe or the harp? How would anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligently words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking in the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of language in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone else is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. For this reason, the one who speaks in tongues should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of inquiry say amen to your thanksgiving, since they do not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edifying. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children in regard to evil and be infants, but in, in your thinking be adults. In the law it is written. With other tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign, but for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if you are an unbeliever or an inquirer come in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all, as the secret of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God. Explain, explain me. God is really among you. Now, I know I went deep into the tongues and things like that, but he's talking about that to say, so they fall down and worship God. Hmm, that's deep. You know, that's the act that I was talking about. It's very important that we um, show that worship 
uh, to God. And as I was reading that, I, I would say that, that that's the paying homage. And there is also a, a word called esbazumia, meaning to render religious honor. In Romans 1.25, uh, and um, the word symbomia, meaning to reverence or adore God. We must adore Him. We must honor Him. We must respect Him. And unless you have a relationship with Him, really, truthfully, you don't know how to do all those things. You have to have a good, serious relationship with God. You must love him with your whole heart, mind, and soul. And then you can pay homage to him. Other than that, you just be like everybody else that says, Oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But guess what? You're doing everything under the sun and you're not bowing down and you're not reverencing him. Period. Now, um, when I was reading, I was about to read Romans 125 it says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praising Amen. See, we must worship Him, but those that don't have a relationship, they're going to exchange, they're going to um, worship and serve the created things rather than the Creator. You're going to sit there and, and, and praise your house, your car, your things that you have, your man, your, your, your children, your woman that's in your life. Uh, uh, whatever it is, you're going to give that homage, but you're serving the created things instead of the Creator. You know, and God is not for that. God does not accept that. That does not do nothing for Him. He, you know, He he made everything. I mean, you know, and it's a blessing to have things, but we must prioritize things. We must put things in proper perspective. Now, Acts, um, the book of Acts in 16, verse uh, 14, it goes into more about worship. And it says, on the Saturday, we went outside the city to the rivers where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of these listening was a woman from the city of Ty, Tytheria named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded them. Now, let's go to where she was a worshiper of God. She worshiped God. God wants us to worship him. Truly worship him. And that was in that was in book of Acts. And then we go and we see the same word used by Jesus to describe the vain hypocritical worship of God. You know, if you go into the book of Matthew, um, chapter 15, and we, in, in the verse 9, it will tell you about uh, that. They, they, these people, I'll go to 8, these people honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are merely human rules. Wow. That's taking you there. That's telling you some stuff. God is saying that he does not care if you sit there. If it's not, if it's not in your heart. Just like these people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. How many times do you know somebody to always talk about God and all that? But it's a, it's a lip service. But their lifestyle says something totally different. But well, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, is what the word says. And they worship me in vain. Their teachers are merely human rules. Come on, think about it. How many times have we done that? When I say we, we're talking about me too. <laughs> the word of God is like a two-way sword. It cuts you and me. So it hit me just as well. And that's when I had to use that. And I realized that I was doing lip service. And, and it was far from my heart. I was just doing the act of Christianity. You know, I mean, looking like it, talking like it. But I wasn't doing it. So my worship was truly in vain to God. 
You know, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's the word. So, like I said, it's, um, as we do things in vain, God is not accepting that. He's not accepting that. So, leading us, it will lead us to the conclusion that not all worship is acceptable to God. But true biblical worship is to be first and foremost reverent. Hebrews 12 and 28 talks about that. This means it is to be done with the understanding of who is being worshipped. God is holy, just, righteous, perfect, powerful, loving, wrathful. Those who wish to worship biblically must worship God as he is revealed in scripture. Now second, we must worship him in truth. John 4:24 uh, expounds on that uh, when he talks about that we must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's, that's true. That's true business. We cannot just talk to God, come to God any kind of way. It says God is a spirit and his, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's not me speaking. That's his word. You know, and if you go a little further, Jesus was talking to the woman and he said, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship him, the Father in the spirit and in the truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is a spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in the truth. Now, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now, you see, he told us what we were supposed to do. That's a mandate to me. That's telling us this is what I'm supposed to do to be a true worshiper. And if I do anything outside of that, contradictory, contrary to that, I'm not. I'm contradicting myself. I, if I say I'm a worshiper and then I don't do it, I'm contradicting what I said out of my mouth. You know, so that's the word of God. That's the word of God. That's not Minister Pia speaking. That's God's word. So this means that that it needs to line up according to the truths in, Christ, in Scripture. Adding our own version of worship and expressing ourselves is not true worship. If it does not accord accord with the word of God. Personal expression of worship are not indicated anywhere in scripture and can lead to activities that are not God honored. Third, true worship is worship in spirit because God is spirit. True worship is pure, holy, spiritual worship, the offering of the soul and the homage of the heart rather than merely that from the lips of the lips. Finally, true worship will always produce a change in the heart of the worshiper, causing a great desire to love and obey the God we worship. Can I say that again? Third, true worship is worship in spirit. Because God is spirit, true worship is a true, holy, spiritual worship. The offering of the soul and the homage of the heart rather than merely that of the lips. Finally, true worship will always produce a change in the heart of the worshipers, causing a greater desire to love and obey the God as we worship. If worship does not propel us into greater obedience, it isn't worship. Unless we come out of it with a greater commitment to obedience, it isn't worship. Jesus said those who love him will keep his commandments. If we say we love and worship him, but do not obey him. Our worship is worthless. Now, true biblical worship of the one true and living God is to be a lifestyle, not a moment in time. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 talks about that. Just as they will be in eternity, our lives are now are to be lives of total worship of God. When we eat, sleep, work, serve, and live from sun up to sundown, all that we do is to be in a spirit of worship of God. We are not to offer temporary experience-oriented worship only on Sunday and then lead a circular life in the rest of the week. True worship is offered to God 
from the depths of our inner being in praise and prayer, in song, in giving, and in living, but, we, but always based upon His revealed truth. So you see, we can, we can sit there and say that we're true worshipers, but if we're worshiping God and then in church and what have you, and then when, and we're and we and, we're, and that's what's happening, and then the next day, all of a sudden, we're not living our lives according to God's word, and the next day we're doing back to our regular circular stuff. Then truly, are you really worshiping God? We must we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Again, we will, when we eat, sleep, work, serve, and live from up from sun up to sundown. All that we do is in the spirit of worship to God. So this is, I'm going to go into the next part of the series on tomorrow. And it's been a blessing to share with you about true worship. And as I stated before, we have to get into the place that we do what God says. No longer do we do it our way. No, even I'm not hating, but then again, you might say I am. I would just say that with the preachers that's not preaching what they should preach from the pulpit and say what they need to say and teach what they need to teach, well, it has to start from the house, right right there in the pulpit, and it goes out. So the pastor needs to start worshiping God, and then he can teach his people. Well, God, or show hers, I'm not partial. Well, God bless you. This is Minister Pia signing out, but just know that God is spirit, and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. God bless you.